Hi, I'm Dan Fry. I teach and do research uh, in mechanical engineering. We're here at MIT in a student lab, and this is a place where young people come and build all different kind of vehicles, like the scooter that I just rode in on, bicycles, motorcycles, and cars. And I think what all these vehicles have in common is they're transforming energy in different ways. Take, for example, your car. You put gasoline in there, that's chemical energy. It gets burned in the pistons, that's thermal energy. Gets turned into uh, mechanical shaft energy. Uh, then kinetic energy of the car going down the road. Potential energy of the car climbing a hill. Uh, but the key thing is that energy is being transformed and we as mechanical engineers have to learn how to manage all that and optimize it and make it efficient. Now, in order to get started on the topic of this video, which is quantifying energy, we need a unit of measure. Now, the most standard unit of measure for energy is the joule, which is defined as a newton meter. In order to make that more concrete, I like to think about, uh, for example, an apple here. An apple weighs about a newton, conveniently. And if I take this apple from a surface like this and raise it up by one meter, it has one more joule of potential energy than it had before. So there's an example of a everyday event, lifting an apple by a meter, and the amount of energy that was involved. Now what I'd like to ask you to do is an exercise. Get together with your instructor back there in the classroom and with your classmates and think of a few more examples of everyday events and uh, tie them to a unit of energy uh, or to a, a quantity of energy. So as an example, let's say you wanted to talk about uh, speaking on a cell phone. Uh, that would take some energy. But what I want you to do is when you come up with your examples, make sure that you've indicated uh, the event clearly enough that you can say how much energy there was. For example, with the phone, you'd have to say talking on the cell phone for a minute. So try to be a little careful. Pick out uh, everyday events and make them vivid examples of a quantity of energy. So you guys were working together to come up with your own examples of some everyday event that would consume a fixed amount of energy that you could anchor to. Now, in order for us all to work together, what I'm going to do is give you a list of five everyday events that have an amount of energy associated with them, and we're all going to try to put them in order together. So let me take you through what that list is. First, I want you to consider how much energy it takes to ride a scooter. You know, one of those two-wheeled uh, kick scooters that I rode in on before. Uh, and to make it more specific, I'm going to say you've got to ride a kilometer and you ride on level, smooth ground. So how much energy does that take? You know it's going to take some work uh, pushing back with your foot and you'll get a little bit tired, but how does that compare to other amounts of energy? Now, the next one is uh, another living thing involved. It's going to be a Canada goose. Uh, it's that kind of black and white and brown sort of goose that's so common here in North America. Uh, if you need to think about some other bird, uh, go ahead and think about that from your part of the world. But a Canada goose is a big old bird here. It migrates uh, from north to south every season. And I'm asking you to consider when they fly at about 1,000 meters up, how much potential energy does one of those geese have? So potential energy of a Canada goose at 1,000 meters above the ground. That's the second common everyday event that I want you to think about. Now a couple more. Uh, one is an ear of corn. So there's energy in this. If I ate it, I'd be able to do some work. And I want you to think about that. You know, how does it relate to other things? Uh, you could think about the goose eating this corn and what it could do. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, labeling of food items. Uh, you want to think about the energy available to, say, a vertebrate who eats this corn. Uh, one more item to put on your list is uh, how much energy is available in a two liter bottle when it's pumped to 60 pounds per square inch. Now these sort of bottles are common pretty much everywhere in the world and they do hold pressure uh, because they hold carbonated beverages. And I'm telling you that we could pump it up to 60 PSI. And when we did that, there'd be a certain amount of energy available in that bottle to do useful work. 
I want you to think about how much energy that is. Uh, and the last one in the list of five is going to be the energy stored in the suspension springs of a car. We're going to go with a Honda Accord. And to be specific, it's how much energy is stored in one of those springs when it's compressed by two centimeters. So I have to give you basically the size of the spring and how much we compress it. That's a quantity of energy. So that's our, li uh, our list of five for the rest of the session. But to give you something specific to work on for the next intermission, I want to take two things from that list, and you're going to put those in an order. And the two I want you to work on are the Canada Goose flying at 1,000 meters and the suspension of the Honda Accord being compressed by two centimeters. And your task for this intermission is to figure out which has more energy, the Goose at 1,000 meters or the suspension spring compressed by two centimeters. Good luck. I know you guys have been working hard on uh, trying to estimate these quantities of energy and put these two events in order. You've been thinking about the Canada Goose flying at 1,000 meters and the energy in that auto suspension spring when you compress it two centimeters. Try to put those in order. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the way that I thought about it. I considered the distances first because those were given. You had the 1,000 meters of height for the Canada Goose. That's straightforward. The two centimeters for the compression of the spring. Those are very different distances, right? Uh, that's a, that's a, a factor of 50,000, big difference in the distances. Now sometimes you can estimate energies by just multiplying a force and a distance. You know, as long as the force and the distance are in the same direction and the force is relatively constant. With the goose, that's definitely true. Uh, and with the car spring, we're going to talk about it. So let's compare those forces now. Are they different by a factor of 50,000? Uh, for example, a goose, you know, how much does that weigh? Well, it's hard to know exactly. You, you could Google it. Uh, but the way I like to think about it is, uh, how does a goose compare to something I know? Maybe I, I know what uh, an infant baby weighs, because I'm a father. So, so I think a goose and an infant are about similar in size. So maybe I'll estimate that a goose weighs 10 pounds or 5 kilograms. So I figure... 5 kilogram goose, that's 50 newton goose here on Earth because acceleration due to gravity is about 10 meters per second squared. So I multiply those two and I get 50,000 joules. That's a lot of energy, I guess. Um, now, how does the energy stored in, in the suspension spring compare to that? Well, I've got to come up with an estimate of force. How much force does it take to compress the spring of a suspension. I think that's going to be hard to estimate, so let's go do a quick experiment out in the parking lot and see for ourselves how much force is involved. Okay, so we're out here in the parking lot to do a quick and dirty experiment. We want to estimate how much energy is stored in one of these automotive suspension springs when it's compressed by two centimeters. Now this is what the suspension looks like inside the Honda Accord. It's a McPherson type you got a spring on the outside and a shock absorber on the inside. So that gives you an idea of what's inside there. Now I'm going to set it down and what we've got here is a meter stick attached to the wheel and we see that the mark on the meter stick is at 31. That's where it meets the fender. Now when I climb up on the hood, I compress down that spring and the whole car moves downward or this corner of the car moves down and we get a reading of 34 centimeters. So my weight, about one kilonewton, is enough to move that spring downward by three centimeters. Or uh, I should say, actually, that the fender moves down by three centimeters. The spring, I wasn't able to observe directly. Because it's a little bit farther inboard than the fender, I think it's a little less than three centimeters. We have to make an estimate. Now. Um, one of the other subtleties that you have to consider here is that I'm getting onto the hood of the car and that's causing the spring to go downward. But in assessing how much energy is in that spring, I have to consider that the weight of the car is actually helping me to compress the spring. Now this car weighs like 10 times what I weigh, but that's supported by four different wheels. So I wanna say uh, the 
the weight of the car that's on the spring is maybe 400 pounds plus my 200 pounds, 600 pounds applied to that spring, compressing it by two centimeters. So 600 pounds of force caused a compression of two centimeters. Now to compute the energy, you can't just multiply those two factors because when I started to sit on the car, it took a lot less than my weight to begin the motion. In fact, what I need to do is integrate the whole area under the force displacement curve. So at the beginning, it takes a little force. The force goes up linearly up to 600 pounds, we estimated, and it's half the weight times the distance that we want to calculate, not the full weight, but half because the shape of the area under the curve is a triangle. So we've made an estimate of the amount of energy in the suspension spring of the Honda. We came up with a number like 10 joules to 50 joules, and we decided that the Goose has a lot more energy than that at 50 kilojoules. A uh, big difference there. Now what we want to do is organize ourselves. We're going to construct a number line, and we're going to put larger amounts of energy to the right and smaller amounts of energy to the left. And so I'm putting the Goose pretty far over to the right here and marking that with 50 kilojoules and I'll put a picture of a goose there. On the left side of the number line I'm putting an image of the suspension of a Honda Accord and marking the amount of energy there. And now what we want to do is use this line to organize our thoughts. We are going to place uh, another event on that number line now, put them in the right order. And the event we're concerned with here is scootering. Uh, now we have to be pretty specific. We're going to say that uh, the scooter goes 5 meters per second on level ground, uh, smooth ground, not going uphill or downhill, and at 5 meters per second. And I guess we should be specific enough to say who the rider is because that affects uh, the rolling resistance and the drag. So let's say it's an 8-year-old an girl. That, that's someone who might ride a scooter. So when a little girl rides a scooter for one kilometer at five meters per second, she gets a little exercise, she expends some energy, but how much? Is it as much as the goose flying all the way up to uh, one kilometer, or is it less than that? We're going to need to make some more refined estimates, and that's your task in the next break in the video. Please work to make an estimate of the energy and compare it to the goose and to the automotive suspension and put it in the right place on, on the line. You've been hard at work trying to figure out where this scooter event fits on our number line. Uh, we asked you to consider how much energy it takes for a little girl to ride a scooter like this, a kilometer, at five meters per second. Now, one of the comparisons you could have made is between the scooter and the goose. That's probably the more interesting comparison than to the suspension. So let's try that. One issue is that uh, you might try comparing the energies, again, by thinking about forces and distances. And since the two distances are exactly the same, the scooter goes 1,000 meters horizontally, and the goose has to go the same distance straight up. You might just focus on the forces for the moment. We know how much a goose weighs. We made an estimate of that. Uh, now, how do we think about estimating the force on a little girl scootering along at five meters per second. Now, uh, probably the dominant force seeking to slow down a scooter rider is aerodynamic drag. Now, aerodynamic drag is a force created as you know the wind or apparent wind goes over the body and the scooter itself. And there's a formula for this, and it is the drag force equals one half rho v squared s c d. Let me go through those terms one by one. Uh, one half is self-explanatory. Uh, the rho, that's the density of the air. Uh, that would be about um, one kilogram per cubic meter, um, in case you want to look that up. Um, v is the velocity. We gave you that, five meters per second. S is the area that the person presents to the flow. And CD is the coefficient of drag. So one of the things you might try to do is figure out the drag force on the little girl scootering along at five meters per second. And uh, the drag force is a function of the coefficient of drag and the area and the density of the air. And um, there are a lot of parameters to estimate and a lot of uncertainty. 
So you can power your way through it and you can get an estimate, but at this point, I really think that there is an alternative approach that you should try. What I would tend to do, and what I'd recommend that you do now, is think of a number of physical experiments you might actually do to assess how much uh, force it takes to propel yourself on a scooter five meters per second and continue at that speed. So I'd like you to get together with the other classmates in the room and with your instructor and think of different physical experiments that would give you insight into how much force is actually involved here. You've been working on uh, thinking about different ways you could run an experiment to assess how much force it would take to keep uh, a little girl on a scooter going five meters per second. Now, there are lots of experiments you could possibly conceive of, but uh, some of the ones that, that I thought of that I thought were most practical involved the scooter going down some kind of a hill. Uh, now, I know that I, I said that the event was a scooter going along a horizontal surface, and therefore the energy would be put in by the little girl kicking and making the scooter move along. But uh, for the thought experiment, I think it's useful to consider a hill because then you get a nice consistent forward force provided by gravity. Now here's how it works. Uh, your weight is a force that pulls down on you at all times. And if you're on a hill, some fraction of that force, your weight, is actually aligned with the surface of the hill and causing you to, uh, to move forward at a constant velocity. So there's a component of the force that is moving in the same direction that you're moving is therefore doing work. Now, what component of the force, your weight, would keep you going at five meters per second? Well, there's a couple of ways to think about this. Uh, one is, you're trying to make a comparison between uh, the goose at a thousand meters uh, and so what you might do is ask well how steep a hill would give you a component of force equal to the weight of a goose so the way I think about it is this uh, I think about my daughter she's about twice as tall as a goose twice as wide as a goose twice as big as a goose in every direction made of about the same stuff, skin and bones and guts and so on. So she weighs about eight times what a goose weighs. Now, therefore, I think about the hill that would put about one-eighth of her weight as a component of force propelling her along. Turns out that the answer is about a 10% grade. It's a hill where, let's say you cro cover 100 meters, well, on that stretch, you would have gone down by 10 meters. It's a very steep hill, it turns out. Um, if you look at the hills, say, coming down out of the mountains of Colorado, they're maybe 7% grade, and they have big warnings to the trucks, you know, to, to get in low gear and watch the heat of their brakes. It's pretty steep. So I think I want to think about it a different way instead. I don't, I don't want to go down a hill with my daughter that steep. Uh, but already I've made a decision that I think probably the goose is going to take more energy uh, than the scooter going horizontally. But I have an experiment we actually did. What I chose is let's pick a grade of hill that will actually keep us going five meters per second. So we went out in our neighborhood and we found a hill that I estimate is about five percent grade. And we did some measurements to check on that. And now we have little girls scootering down that hill. We made a bunch of marks on the pavement, uh, five meters space between each. Here comes Paige. And we measured how long it took her, each of those little girls to go 25 meters. We measured the time. And we could see that on that hill, each of those girls was going about five meters per second. So now we know a 5% grade hill is enough for a little girl to go five meters per second. And we know that on a 5% grade, about 5% of their weight is going forward. And 5% of the weight of a little girl is a lot less than the weight of a goose. It's maybe a third the weight of a goose. So at this stage, we have enough data to put that event on our number line. It goes close to the goose flying at 1,000 meters, uh, but substantially higher than the automotive suspension. And we're going to place them on the number line uh, right here where you see on the screen. So we have three things plotted on our number line right now. 
And it turns out they're all things that are kind of in the mechanical domain. We've been talking about forces and we've been talking about distances. I want to change it up a little bit now. I'm going to ask you to consider the uh, item in our list that is in a different domain. Let's talk about the ear of corn now. Uh, the ear of corn has energy in a chemical form and I want you to figure out where that lies on the number line. Is it, say, similar to the energy in the automotive suspension or is it similar to the goose flying at a thousand meters or more than that? You may have been thinking about the ear of corn based on some things you've learned about counting calories. Maybe you or your parents look at the food labels and understand roughly how many calories are in things like an ear of corn. And I came up with an estimate of like a hundred. Uh, and, and if you do a little Googling, you'll find numbers that are in that range. Now one thing that's potentially confusing is that you'll read about a definition of a calorie and a calorie in terms of uh, thermodynamics is the amount of energy that's required to heat up a gram of water by a degree Celsius. Now what's confusing is that these dietary calories that are labeled on our foods, those are actually a thousand calories. Dietary calories are kilocalories. So if you put those two pieces of information together, you've got a hundred calories, dietary calories, in an ear of corn. Uh, and the definition of what a calorie is, you find that you could take an ear of corn and use it to heat a kilogram of water by 100 degrees Celsius. So imagine taking a liter of water, that would weigh about a kilogram, and heating it up from almost freezing cold to almost boiling hot. That's what an ear of corn could do. Now, you want to be able to think about this and compare that amount of energy to something mechanical, like the scooter and uh, the, the suspension spring in the Honda Accord. So it's important to understand that a calorie is actually four joules. There's a conversion that you have to do. So what we find is that taking that last conversion into account, the ear of corn is 100 dietary calories, which is 100,000 calories, which is 400,000 joules. That's like half a million joules. That's a lot of energy, it's way more than anything else that we put on our list so far. So we're gonna put the ear of corn on our number line here way over at the right and understanding that we're crossing a lot of distance here with these numbers, let's say that this number line is in a logarithmic scale. So each unit is not an amount of energy but a multiplying factor of energy. So we put the corn on the list and we've got just one more item now. Uh, the corn was in the chemical domain, let's do the two liters of compressed air at 60 PSI, your job is to figure out how this amount of energy, which is in the fluid domain now, fits in with all these other kinds of energy that you've been considering. Trying to come up with an estimate now for the amount of energy in a two liter bottle pumped to 60 PSI, that's a hard one. There are lots of different ways you can do it and you probably tried a lot of different ways. Uh, and rather than go through all that in detail now, I want to let you know that first of all, the answer is around a kilojoule. So it goes around in the middle of our list, uh, as you'll see on the screen. And I want to tell you that in order to see some of the different ways of doing it in detail, we're making a number of resources available to you online on the Blossoms website, multiple different ways of making that estimate of the energy it takes to pump up a two liter bottle of air to 60 PSI. So, now we've got the complete list, five items all in order. We've covered a massive range here. Uh, the car suspension took on the order of tens of joules to compress by two centimeters. The ear of corn took like a half a million joules uh, in order to, you know, that's the food energy available in that item. And the other items are covering the range in between. Now, let me take a moment to say what are the key lessons we take away from having done this exercise of ranking different things? One is 
that energy is a really important concept in physics and engineering. It's something that's around us all the time, and it helps us to understand and quantify all different kinds of events. If you really want to be able to understand energy, it helps to be able to put it into a numerical form, to put quantities onto these events. And in order to do that, you have to compare them to some unit of measure. So we want to quantify energy. That requires a measurement scale, and that requires careful analysis. Now, if you want to get good at making those kinds of calculations and estimates, a, a decent way to start 